Welcome, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom alaikum. Uh, my name is Max Nieberger. I'm the founder of Jewish Insider. Exactly two weeks ago today, the Abraham Accords between the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Bahrain, and the United States uh, were signed on the South Lawn of the White House. And it's a tremendous privilege of ours uh, to host a number of the key leaders uh, and individuals who are instrumental in bringing the historic agreement about. Uh, we have with us here today the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United States, and one of the most connected uh, men in Washington, uh, Ambassador Yusuf al -Taba, together with his good friend uh, and longtime JI reader from Los Angeles, Haim Saban. And we're excited to learn a little bit more about how their friendship uh, played a key role in bringing about the Abraham Accords. And of course, we're honored uh, that one of the most connected women and really individuals on the planet, Dina Powell McCormick is here uh, to lead the conversation. Before I turn it over to Dina, I wanna note just three quick things. One, this truly would not be happening without Dina, uh, who is a top reader and advocate for Jewish Insider. And so thank you, Dina. Uh, the second is that immediately following this first uh, panel discussion, we'll be hearing from the UAE's UN ambassador, Lana Nuseba, along with the UAE's chief rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, uh, so please stick around uh, for that. And lastly, I'll just note that all three of our panelists for the first panel were either born uh, or raised in Egypt, and that includes uh, Dina. So Dina, as you uh, take this away, I was hoping you could share a bit uh, with our audience about your father, who I understand was a captain in the Egyptian army under Anwar Sadat, who of course signed uh, the Egypt-Israel peace treaty just a little over uh, 40 years ago with uh, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and how you've seen the Middle East evolve uh, both uh, th through your eyes and, and your father's um, as kind of a backdrop for today's conversation. So Dina, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Max. I'm so delighted uh, to be here with you and to participate in this great session. Uh, Haim and the ambassador and I know well that the real most connected power broker in Washington is Max Neuberger and that Jewish Insider is must reading every single day and that is why your subscriptions keep growing and uh, we're all really proud of you and the role frankly that you're playing to shine such an important light on the region of our births and, and a critical region for the world. It's such a pleasure of course also uh, to be with Haim Savan who needs no introduction and somehow had uh, has never not played an important role when these things have come together. And uh, we're gonna ask him some specific questions about the role he played. And then of course, my friend, Ambassador Alateba. I was joking with the ambassador when we were on the South Lawn uh, two weeks ago, I uh, had the uh, pleasure of attending the ceremony and Haim was there and the ambassador was there. And I said, you know, ambassador, we've been friends for nearly 20 years and you played a pretty big role when I was working for President Bush on these issues. But I have to say, being named one of the Time 100 most influential people in the world is a pretty cool new level. Uh, but you really have played such an instrumental role. I had just had to give you a little bit of a hard time on that one. Um, so I'm really delighted. We've got 30 minutes. And what I really hope we can do today for everybody uh, that's participating is really talk about the significance of the Abraham Accords. It is pretty significant to see the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Israel, and the US come together in such a way. So I think I'd love to start with you, Ambassador, and talk a little bit about behind the scenes, how this all came together, and how instrumental you played, the role that you played was, particularly after you wrote the op-ed. Sure. First, thank you. Thank you for having me. So let me start by thanking Max. And Max, you definitely get the diversity award today because you managed to pull off a panel that is represented by an Israeli-American Jew, an Egyptian-American Coptic Christian, and an Emirati <laughs> Egyptian Muslim. So diversity <laughs> award goes to Max Neuberger today. How did this happen? It started before the op-ed. It actually started before the op-ed in a series of conversations with our friends in the White House about how dangerous we thought annexation was going to be. We thought annexation was gonna be dangerous to the region, we thought it was gonna be dangerous for Israel. More importantly, we thought it was gonna be a really, really bad issue for the Americans to defend in our part of the world. 
So we desperately became, we started looking for ways to avoid annexation. And that's where the idea of the op-ed came up. My leadership, I've been pestering my leadership for a long time to start speaking to Israelis and say, hey, be careful. This is not a good decision. All the things you want to do with us are going to be at risk if you proceed with annexation. So they finally said, Yusuf, you've been you know, bothering us with this for a while. Why don't you write something? So the idea came from Abu Dhabi. It was tasked to me. We started thinking about how to draft the article that sends this clear message. And that's when I called Haim. I said, Haim, we have this idea, but I don't know anything about the media environment in Israel. What should we do? And Haim told me where it should be placed, when it should be placed. And the most important piece of advice on this was you have to do it in Hebrew. If you really want to speak to the Israelis, it has to be translated in Hebrew. So I think the idea came to us, which we then consulted with Haim, who helped us execute it the right way. And then I remember a subsequent conversation with Haim asking him, hey, do you think, do you think this article made an impact? And he started laughing at me, like laughing loudly. He's like, you have no idea how much impact this article had. And it was shortly after the article we then started thinking of ways, actual concrete ideas to avoid annexation. And it was really after the annexation deadline. I remember having a really serious conversation with Avi Berkowitz on July 2nd, right after he returned from Israel, and figuring out what we can do to prevent it. How do we trade this? How do we give something better? And that's how we came up with the deal that we came up with, which is for in exchange for assurances on no annexation, the UAE is prepared to normalize its relationship with Israel. And it's really like the beauty of the deal is its simplicity. This is it. We'll trade you something much better than annexation. And then there was a poll in Israel, I think a week after the announcement that said 80% of Israel supported or preferred normalization than annexation. And Haim knows far better than me and I'll hand over him to him now. I think 80% of Israel doesn't agree on anything. The right from the left. So the fact that they support with this level of confidence, something that they see is better for their country and their people sort of validated that this was the right thing to do. I'm pick it up from there because I know you've been working on these issues, as I said, for many, many years, but sometimes the time has to be right. Were you really hopeful when you first talked to Yusuf that this could be a game changing moment? I always believe that it can be a very significant game changing moment simply because there was no precedent, no precedent for public commitment to normalization for something very specific, no annexation, unprecedented. And, you know, Israelis would give their right arm to have peace with all its Arab neighbors, would give its right arm, um, you know, this is just, Yusuf said, no, 80% of Israelis agree on anything. But on that, they would agree. They would give their right arm to have normalization. And what Yusuf's piece did is it put it on the table. It made it real. He said, you want normalization? We got normalization. Not negotiation like in a suit, you know, of the Middle East. No <laughs> negotiations. You don't annex, normalization will come. No annexation, normalization. Simple to understand. So simple that the vast majority of Israelis, 80% plus, agreed upon. So, you know, so did it have an impact? Massive impact. What it did, I mean, there's been years of, be, you know, below the radar, different cooperation at certain levels, but never in the open, in the matter that it happened as a result of this article. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe sometimes that, you know, one article in the paper can have a historical, historical impact. And this is what it did. And I have to commend uh, Yosef and all his bosses in the UAE for the courage. It takes a lot of courage because it was clear they're gonna get their butts kicked from different sources. You know, this, that's the nature of the beast. 
And they took the jump. And they took the jump. So they have to be committed, commanded on it, you know. So it's remarkable what they've done. I agree with you. And I think it showed great leadership. Um, you know, Sheikh Mohammed has for a long time hoped to see a broad uh, peace in the region. And I think it'd be helpful, uh, Yusuf, if you kind of walk through just what this really means to Heim's point. Immediate normalization, obviously. Uh, immediate trade, which I think is going to have significant economic opportunity uh, between not just the two and three countries, but throughout the region. You know, at Goldman Sachs, we're already having clients call us and ask about investment opportunities. Um, but walk us through how immediate these changes will, will be enacted and what it really means on the ground. So it's, it's really interesting. I think it, you know, one of the questions that you are touching on right now is probably the most overlooked question because everyone analyzes this. Well, what does this mean about Iran? What does this mean about security? And I think people forget about the, the immediate benefits that we're going to have once you have direct commercial flights and tourism about trade, investment, research, development, COVID research. It is not a coincidence that when Jared Kushner came from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi on that historic flight, the first set of MOUs that we sub it, submitted to the United States to get done were on consular affairs, civil aviation, trade, prevention of double taxation, protection of investments. What we feel is the foundation, the infrastructure for any healthy relationship so we can have mutual wins, so you can have trade investment R&D. Um, those are the things that we submitted first. Once we have that infrastructure in place, once an Emirati investor feels that he can invest in Israel safely and an Israeli investor feels that he can invest in the UAE safely and not get taxed twice, once that begins, once that's in place, I think the stars, the stars are the limit. And by the way, it's already happened before those agreements are signed. So we've already seen MOUs on AI, on COVID research, on healthcare. And just today, I haven't sent it to you, but a very prominent soccer club in Dubai bought an Israeli soccer player. Wow. So, so these things are happening without the government pushing for them which means there is a thirst, there's a demand. Like we look at Israel, looks really interesting, but it's kind of this off limits market that we can't touch. And I suspect Israelis look at the UAE and say, wow, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, they seem interesting, but we can't really visit. So there's this, there's this pent up demand both in both directions that I think is going to be unleashed once we have the proper infrastructure to protect it. But and I think I, there's I, also I, an enormous opportunity for entrepreneurship. I mean, you think, absolutely. of course, as our friend Dan Sinor uh, says, this Israel is a startup nation, extraordinary entrepreneurship and opportunity. And hi, you know, for many years working with the Emiratis, uh, what a strong entrepreneurial spirit there is. And even looking today, uh, as Yusuf was describing, joint research on space exploration, for example, AI, new technology opportunities. As a businessman, do you see... The, the, these pieces of the deal having a significant impact to drive job creation and growth within the region? I can tell you that since uh, the peace accord was announced and Yusuf gave me much more credit than I deserve, a lot of people think that uh, maybe I make decisions at the Emiratis. Guess what? <laughs> I'm friends with Yusuf and I helped a friend with an article. That's it. That's it. That's my contribution. It turned out to be a lot more than we thought it would be, but that's my contribution. Nothing more and nothing less. But I don't have any pulls at the Emiratis. But the perception is that I do. So over the since it was announced, I have received five requests from different Israeli entrepreneurs. We have this idea for an investment. Can you connect us to the Yechotopakotopak? I said, I'm not the guy. What do you want from me? You know, so five requests. That's not a lot, but that's quite a bit. The people look at me and think, you know, through him, I'm going to get to the Emiratis. You know, so obviously I'm going to take all these uh, you know, opportunities that are presented and just send them to Yusuf and he will do with it whatever he, he wants to do. If it benefits the Emiratis, Allah kefak. And if it doesn't, then uh, 
at all. No, nothing. Nothing will happen. Um, we, frankly, even uh, my chief investment officer and the head of my VC division, they came to me and they said, we have an idea that we can do with the Emiratis. I said, okay, can you help us present it? I said, you put the idea together. I can be a wonderful messenger boy. Bukhalas. Nothing more and nothing less. You know, so, yes, as an entrepreneur, we are seeing the Israelis. I can tell you they are. <laughs> they are very aggressive and uh, they will present many opportunities of cooperation. Um, and to be honest with you, based on what I saw, the Emiratis are not less aggressive in their entrepreneurship. So when you put those two together, some really good stuff will come out of it for both countries. For both countries. That's true. Well, you, good, good that you know the right Emirati to call. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience um, for the ambassador about how um, it was to work with the Trump administration on this and Sheikh Mohammed trusting President Trump. And, and these are big leaps that everyone took. And obviously the administration was extremely focused um, on you know, producing results in a very tense time in the region. So maybe talk to us a little bit about your engagement with Jared and Avi and uh, Ambassador Friedman and Dermer because it took a lot of people, you know, to bring this together, but I think it really did require a basis of trust that, you know, people would say, would do what they said they would do. So to be totally honest and frank, I don't think if it was, if it was, if it wasn't for the Trump administration, the team we worked with, and it's, it was really primarily Jared, Avi Berkowitz and Miguel Correa, they deserve a huge shout out because I spoke and talked to them and met with them probably more in that four weeks than I did with anybody else including my own family. Uh, if it wasn't for them, I'm not sure this deal would be done. They're, for anything like this to happen, like you just said, it takes an incredible amount of trust. I mean, we weren't signing documents, right? We were just saying, hey, we're gonna do this if they do that. And you have to sort of put your credibility and your, your status on the line and believe that the White House is going to deliver on what we agreed to, and they did. And I think at some points, even when it looked not as optimistic as I would like, I think the United States government came through every single time. And that's the reason we had the signing ceremony two weeks ago in the White House. And, you know, Haim spoke of courage. I can't let this panel end without saying this. Haim flew from LA to DC to attend that ceremony in person. And that was also a huge demonstration of courage. Thank you, Haim, for being there. You can translate for those who don't speak Arabic. I don't. Uh... <laughs> I can't translate, but I mean, with pleasure. With pleasure. <laughs> um, you know, Haim, um, I wanted to sort of ask you though about another element that I think uh, was Im imperative, and that is this growing coalition. I was I was telling Yusuf before the call. It seems that there is a growing coalition, and hopefully more countries looking to find a way to normalize relationships uh, and opportunities with Israel. And in a sense, a coalition that's focused on peace and hope for the next generations in the region. And then a very clear coalition of terror, Iran and Iran, Iranian proxies in the region. Do, how much do you think the threat of Iran and the, going, the growing threat in many countries that's fueled by Iranian terrorist activity had something to do with bringing this all together? Well, there's no question that uh, when you have a common enemy that is basically, you know, a cancer in the region, um, you know, you unite forces uh, against that enemy. Case in point, it's been years that that, uh, that Iran has had this, this behavior in the region that we all know about you know, the race to a nuclear weapon, the proxies, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that, you know, over time, people have realized that there is much more upside in aligning with Israel and forming a front, in, you know, against Iran. So I think it has a lot to do, but it's not enough. There are other aspects, obviously, 
uh, to, to, for example, the annexation uh, that certain Arab countries cannot allow themselves to just, you know, pass over it and say, okay, you want to annex, annex, let's have uh, a relationship, let's have normalization. So the Iran aspect is without a doubt uh, an important aspect. But there are other aspects also that, depending on which country you're talking about, that need to fall into place. I would be remiss, though, because uh, if I didn't mention um, four names of people who are responsible for all this. First of all, MBZ, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the courage. Second, Sheikh Abdullah. Third, Jared. Fourth, Yusuf al -Oteiba. And five, I said four, it's five. And five, Yossi Cohen, the head of the Mossad. To me, knowing the little that I know, that's my perception. Uh, that these people are the people who brought it all together. And um, people need to recognize that. That these are the people with the courage and uh, the, the strong desire for peace that found a formula to bring the two countries together. And they should be commanded on. Well, and President Trump has been talking about other countries as well. And I wanted to ask the ambassador, what do you think um, are the sort of considerations? Haim says there's on the, on the side of, you know, wanting to work with Israel, wanting to have a stronger front against Iran. Uh, but what are other considerations that countries that I think are ready, whose citizens are eager to do uh, what the Emirati citizens are doing, and that is trade with Israel, visit, et cetera. What, what are those considerations that countries like Oman, Sudan, other countries being talked about are thinking about today? And how quickly do you think they might move? So I think any country, when they have to make a decision like this, they have to balance a variety of internal domestic issues. One is economic, right? What are the benefits? Is, is trade and investment and job creation and flight, is, is it enough? Is this all I need, right? Public opinion. Different countries have different public opinion inside about the relationship with Israel. I mean, people always think we do not pay attention to public opinion inside the Emirates because we're not a democracy. And, and it's actually quite the opposite. Because we're not a democracy, we have to be very in tune with what, what our people want and what the street feel. And people really wanted this. This is not something that we are forcing against the popular will of the Emiratis that live in the country. This is some, there is a genuine energy that people are excited about this. So for each country, that balance, that ratio between economic, political, uh, domestic is very different. We've heard Sudan, for example, but Sudan is going through a transitional period. For the UAE, once a decision was made, there was kind of like a, okay, we're all on board, let's go. But Sudan is in a different era, in a different stage. Oman has a new uh, sultan. Uh, so I, it's hard for me to tell you where each of those countries are because they have to make those calculations based on what their personal national interests are. Um, what I do know is that we broke a taboo. We just demonstrated that something that everyone said could not be done, not only has been done, but has been incredibly well received. And I think maybe this is a good project or assignment for Max. Max, go through the countries that have supported this Abraham Accords when it came out, and then list the countries that condemned or criticized. And you'll see a very clear fault line in our part of the world, at least, about countries that are looking forward and about countries that are looking back. Well, and, and you're exactly right that it's the people on the ground who are pushing. You know, 80% of the region, we often say this, is under the age of 30. And I think that leaders, it seems to me today in the region are beginning to focus on the fact that their people are ready, ready for reforms, much needed reforms, for more economic empowerment and empowerment of women, for having a right and a voice in the future of their government and their country. And so I do think that pressure, it seems, is more real than it's ever been. Do you agree with that, Haim? Do you think leaders, as, as the ambassador is saying, are you know feeling the sort of street pressure to move the region forward. So many decades of, I think, lost hope and opportunity. You know, are we at a moment where we might begin to be hopeful? 
you know, Yusuf made a, an interesting statement. He said, because we're not a democracy, we have to listen to the street even more. So absolutely the street has a big role to play. But the street is also a result of the way the leaders educate their people. If you go to the United uh, Emirates, what do you see? You see a general vibe of tolerance and acceptance of the other. From the Pope's visit all the way to building a temple, I mean, it's kind of funny. I told my wife today that there will be uh, a panel with the rabbi of Abu Dhabi, the chief rabbi of Abu Dhabi. And she looked at me and she said, Abu Dhabi has a chief rabbi. I said, Abu Dhabi has a chief rabbi. They live in a world of tolerance and acceptance of each other. You know, so the street is a result of how the leadership sets the tone. Unfortunately, certain countries on their media still portray Jews as uh, the, uh, drinking the blood of children on Passover and I don't know all kinds of craziness that as any normal person understands it's baloney, right? So it's all about how the leadership educates their people. You have the United Arab Emirates on one side and then you have others that will remain nameless on the other because there is hope that one day these others will also come closer to the way Abu Dhabi deals with life. So in our, in our just final minutes, I have a whole bunch of questions. And one of them is about uh, the potential for peace and, and how this plays out in terms of um, the two-state two solution and it's questions for you, Ambassador. You know, obviously the Palestinians uh, were not as supportive of this. And, you know, a lot of questions are coming in on, does this help or hurt the prospects for what, uh, you know, Jason Greenblatt and Ron Dermer and Jared and many others and you have been working on for a broader peace in the region? So I think this deal, the Abraham Accords, preserved the two-state solution doesn't create a two-state solution, it preserves the, the viability of one. Because if annexation had taken place, the three of us would be on a panel today discussing the consequences of annexation, one of which would be two-state solution is dead. So we bought time, we've bought time, we've put time on the clock. How that time gets ultimately used by the United States, Palestine and Israel is up to them. Um, I, I don't think the UAE is in a position to force two parties of any kind to make a deal they ultimately don't want to do. It's going to be up to Israel and Palestine to decide that they want this. And I think it's going to require handholding by the United States in order to get them to want to do this. But like I said, I think what our role was, we preserved the viability and the potential for a two state solution that otherwise would have been dead. And Haim? Yes, Tina. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Look, it's in the interest of Israel, it's in the interest of the Palestinians to have a two-state solution. Uh, I've always been a proponent and a supporter of finding a solution for the Palestinians to have their own country. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of wood to chop. This is this is a difficult one. This is really a very complicated one where a lot of smart people for decades have worked at trying to find a solution and have failed. Which is why I came out in support of the Trump peace plan because I thought, you know what? It's outside of the box. And uh, well, I should say the Jared peace plan, but anyway, so, uh, it's out of the box. It's very different than everything that was done before. And you can't keep on trying to do the same thing and expect a different result. With that plan, with the Jared plan, it became, you know, something that maybe has a shot. Maybe has a shot. But whether Abu Mazen gathers the courage to move forward and sit at the table, 
or whether his successor has the courage. One thing that is missing is educating the Palestinian people to peace. Unfortunately, the Palestinian media, as you know, does not promote peace. Does not promote. It is true that Abu Mazen is against violence. We'll give him that. But beyond that, the media that he controls is pretty scary. If you watch that, it's pretty scary. When John Kerry went uh, to Israel together with Martin Indyk for, I don't know, nine months or something back in 2014 and lived between Jerusalem and Ramallah back and forth, I called John and I said, John, I don't understand the issue of security, this border, that border, you know, cameras, not cameras, whatever, above my pay grade. Here's what I do understand. I do understand marketing. Get the Palestinian leadership to market peace and tolerance and not, you know, encouragement of, uh, you know, intifadas and other activities. I'm not talking about Hamas. That's a completely different treatment in Gaza that needs to be taken. I'm talking about the West Bank and Fatah. And um, he said, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Whether he did or not, I don't know. But here's what I do know. The Palestinian media, unfortunately, is not educating its people to tolerance. And uh, they would do well, the Palestinian leadership, to take the Emiratis as an example about how you get to peace. Well, thank you. I think we're coming to a close. I see the rabbi is joining us and uh, my friend, the amazing ambassador uh, from the UAE to the United Nations. Lana is joining as well for this next panel. Uh, you know, it's been really terrific to have this conversation. Uh, I, I actually do believe this is a tipping point moment. I know we're always hopeful and saying that, but it certainly feels that way. And I think that we all will continue uh, to pray and hope for more progress on these issues and in the region. And Max Newberger will be front and center in pushing that. Uh, so let me turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Max. Thank you, Haim. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, thank you, the ambassador. Thank you to Chaim. Uh, well, the diversity of religions that Ambassador Ateba mentioned um, at the outset might sound like a, a setup for a joke. Uh, this panel was anything but. It was excellent. Um, so again, thank you to everyone. 